uh, I came to school here at Brooks. I was actually the president of the school when I was here in the 70s. <laughs> and uh, it's really funny how surprised uh, you can be when you come back. When I left here, I went away to, um, I went away to uh, a boarding school, a boys' boarding school. Uh, my father, since I was quite young, he said, you know, he, he noticed I could read something and I could remember it. And it was, it was, well, I call it like a talent in the sense of, you know, some people have a bent towards certain things. They have an ease with it. Just like I was short, it, it was really not meaningful to me in any, in any way. It just, it, it just was something that was. Uh, but I had something that I, I call also the Great Red Hope Syndrome. Any young person with a bit of promise, particularly if you're uh, First Nations, uh, people say to you, you have to get an education and you have to help the people. I kind of understood that. I understood helping the people because where I came from, I, I had a really wonderful, beautiful elder who, who's now passed on. And she used to tell me about a time before there was school, before there were schools like, like this one. And she would say that in the morning, her education was to be sent out to be with this woman over there to help her with her children or to go over there and to get water or to go over there to cut some wood, that there was nothing to do, there was nothing to do but help the people. And I, I understood that, I heard that, and I was lucky enough to have a father who loved to be on the land. In fact, in fact uh, he grew up in the bush. It was a time of residential school. Aboriginal people weren't allowed to raise their own children. And uh, he grew up in the bush with his grandmother. And he had lots of skills and resources that others didn't have. It was a kind of wealth. But I thought we were poor. I wanted to sit on the couch and watch TV, what, what I thought the other boys were allowed to do. When my father married, uh, my mother went to residential school, and she went to grade 12. She was there actually for 15 years, starting from when she was three years old, because her family members had tuberculosis, so she went to a TB hospital near the residential school. And when she came home and they married, she didn't know how to make fish head soup, which is my father's favorite dish. She didn't know to cut the gills out. And uh, his grandmother, who raised him, said, where did you find this woman? She doesn't have this simple knowledge. And he had to explain to her. And maybe that's, maybe that's why, when I was a boy, he insisted that I be on the land and I learn the things that what he felt any person should learn. And that's about where you live to know the waterways, to know what food is available, to know what the winds were like, uh, to know the weather, to know when it was dangerous, to be out and about. And he thought it was weird for a young person to sit in a box for years and years and years to do their learning. But when I got older and I went to a boys' school and then I went on to college, uh, one day I was walking down the street and uh, I was studying biochemistry at McGill. Uh, a woman came up to me and she said, are you an actor? And I completely lied. I don't know why I just did. I said, yeah. She said, come and audition for me tomorrow. I'm casting this movie. I'm having a hard time. And, uh, and uh, she cast me. I, I got the second lead in a Canadian film called Toby McTeague. And I went from being, uh, for those of you who've done undergraduate science degrees, you know what incredibly difficult work it, it is and how much uh, it's a dog's life. That you, you go to school and it feels like no one cares whether you live or die. And suddenly I went from being living a dog's life to living a very glamorous life, making $5,000 a week, in the 80s dollars, $5,000 a week, making a movie, and I, I got bitten by the bug. I thought, okay, enough of this academic stuff. <laughs> let's, um, let's make movies. So I worked for a long time. I made over 200 shows. But when I was about 29, uh, I had seen a really beautiful, wonderful, older Canadian actress um, playing King Lear, a woman playing the, the male role of King Lear in, you know, in a Shakespearean piece, and how she would drop lines occasionally because her, her memory wasn't amazing. It wasn't, it wasn't word perfect. And I remember the critics being so unkind to her and saying it was time for her to go. And I thought, if if I live that long, when I get to be that old, that's what will happen to me. One day someone will say, well, thanks very much for 50 years of service, but you've got to go. And I, and I thought, well, I have this other dream, 
And I have this best friend who's a doctor, and she said, yeah, you're smart enough to be a doctor. If that's what you want to do, then you should do that. You can do that. And we should all have someone who believes in us. Uh, so I applied to medical school. And I remember <laughs> I was here in Slammon. Even though mainly I was living in Vancouver, I was here in Slammon uh, for the summer. My, I was working in the garden with my dad. And the medical school called after all my interviews. And I, I took the phone and I said, hello. And it was uh, one of the staff from admissions. And she said, Evan Adams, you're going to be a doctor. We've accepted you into the class of 2002. And I turned to my dad and I said, Dad, I'm going to be a doctor. And he said, oh, pass me that hoe. <laughs> my dad's up there. That one's for him. So I became a, a doctor. I went to medical school. It was a really odd uh, um, life to uh, go from being an actor where you worry about your instrument, you, you, you're so incredibly self-involved, to taking care of tens of thousands of patients as you get ready. Tens of thousands of patients you look after before they let you actually be a doctor. So medical school was difficult, and I kept working. I did over 40 shows uh, while I was a medical student, um, including one called Smoke Signals, which is um, the previous slide. That's a, that's a, um, a picture from Smoke Signals. I hope some of you have seen it. Actually, when I, it, this came out the same uh, weekend I started medical school, so I missed a lot of uh, I missed a lot of the uh, hullabaloo around the opening of this. Uh, it won uh, the audience prize at Sundance, which is one of the largest film festivals in the world. It won best director. We made a top ten list in the New York Times and the Chicago Tribune, and. Uh, uh, it, it was really quite trippy. Everyone should be in a hit movie. It's, it's a lot of fun. <laughs> and, and one day, um, while I was um, on service as a medical student, um, I was uh, helping to deliver this baby. Uh, actually, I was supposed to take the baby. It was a high-risk delivery. The mother had been laboring for a long time. The, the obstetrician stepped out. I was there to receive the baby. The baby was coming. The dad was freaking out. And the, and the mom uh, was an Aboriginal woman. Now, Aboriginal people are only one, sorry, one in 25 people, roughly, in the country. So most of my patients were not Aboriginal people. She, but um, she came up to me many, many months later in the street, and she said, do you remember me? And women in the midst of labor look really different <laughs> than they do six months postpartum. And I said, I'm sorry, I don't remember you. And she said, you helped deliver my baby, remember? I was pushing, I was screaming, I was swearing, and then it was like a dream. I opened my eyes, and there was Evan Adams standing between my legs. <laughs> but I became a doctor. <laughs> and I remember I was trying to leave, because the BBC offered me a miniseries playing a caveman, of all things. <laughs> well, actually, it was an Indian who was crossing the, the, uh, the Bering Strait, the bridge, the land bridge. And uh, I wanted to do it. I thought, oh, this sounds like fun. I went once again to my dean and said, can I go? And he said, no, of course you can't. You have to finish school. I've let you out many, many times. I said, but how can I say I turned down a BBC miniseries so I could read a book? And he said, well, being a doctor is a chance of a lifetime, just like being in a movie. And you have to do this if you're going to do it now. So I said, OK. Today I wanted to talk to you about wellness and two-eyed seeing and system change. I work as a population health physician. I look after groups of people, not individual clients. These two masks, to me, represent two-eyed seeing or having your feet in two different places. It represents dichotomy or binaryism, the fact that most of us are pluralistic. We're more than just one identity. We don't just want to be a good wife. We also want to be good at our work. We don't just want to be beautiful. We also want to be strong. We don't just want to be creative. We want to be sincere. We don't want to just be famous. We, we want to be known for having some skill. So the idea of two-eyed seeing and in this case, I'll, I'll explain it. It's about having a, a, 
a cultural focus that's binary. Um, I thought that these images were really quite important to us. These masks are, are most probably Nisga. The closed eye mask, sorry, the open eye mask, lives in the Louvre in, in Paris. The closed eyes mask lives at the Canadian Museum of Civilization. Uh, they were collected in the late 1800s. Uh, one, was open, or one was collected by William Duncan. The open-eyed mask was collected by William Duncan, who was a missionary in Metla Katla. The other was collected uh, by Israel Wood Powell, the Deputy Commissioner of Indian Affairs for BC. And you've probably heard his name, like in the name Powell River, because uh, our river where our people used to live was named after him. So these masks were meant to be danced together. No one knew this until 1975 when they were brought together by accident. They were meant to be danced together and the dancer who was moving with the masks would, would um, lift up his blanket and switch the mask and it would look like the stone mask was blinking. So these masks were meant to be together and they represent to me perhaps some things should be together and it's not quite obvious to us. This um, slide also represents dichotomy to me. This is Savory Island. You all know Savory. I've only caught in, um, the undeveloped side. Half of Savory uh, belongs to Slimon First Nation. Half of Slimon uh, belongs in private hands. And uh, on one side, as you know, has, well, both sides have incredibly beautiful real estate. But one side is undeveloped, and the other side is completely developed and they represent dichotomy. One side isn't necessarily better than the other. Maybe you have an opinion on which side is the better side, but it's really just an opinion. One side has infrastructure, it has people, it supports the population, people can go there and visit. The other side is beautiful, it's untouched, but no one lives there. There's no running water, there's no septic. You can't really stay there. You know, unless you're a real old-time Indian like my dad, and you can live on the beach with a knife and a coat and a <laughs> pair of matches. <laughs> but the world that we live in is um, the world that we live in in British Columbia has Aboriginal people, and we know that Aboriginal people's health is terrible. And this is the work that I do now. I went from worrying about my TV hair to looking after 200,000 Aboriginal people who have the worst health of any ethnic group in the country. So Aboriginal people went from owning everything to owning almost nothing and being at the bottom of the socioeconomic and wellness index. And that's partly, partly due to history. What's really important about this though, and because I'm, I'm not asking you to care about all populations, uh, that's my job, because lots of people don't care about all segments of the population. For instance, the prison population, lots of people don't really care about them. We just issued a report from my office around the health of prisoners, and we know from hearing from other British Columbians, they really want punitive measures rather than protective measures or rehabilitative measures or reintegration measures for those prisoners. But the most important thing about Aboriginal people's health and why we should care is that it's actually immoral. It is immoral for any racial group within a country to have better health than another racial group. And we should fight for equity and for equality. <laughs> so these are my parents, so my sister and my brother-in-law. They're, um, they're the Aboriginal middle class. They're actually the almost invisible layer of Aboriginal society because the populist notion of the Indian problem is of uh, the Aboriginal person in terrible health with few resources. And so I, I actually put this up because if I stigmatize my own populations, if I make them seem sick, <laughs> then I'm actually doing a disservice. In fact, the Royal Commission, which identified us as the, um, the worst off ethnic group in the country, was used um, in a custody battle between an Aboriginal and a non-Aboriginal parent. The non-Aboriginal parent citing um, these research, uh, saying that uh, where Aboriginal people live are unfit places for children to live, and thus custody should be awarded to the non-Aboriginal patient. So pathologizing populations generalizing and saying we are all sick or stuck or ill-behaved um, doesn't do anyone any good. 
I want to share with you my final story, which was when I was looking after an elderly um, Aboriginal woman uh, at the end of her life, and uh, she went into an arrhythmia, uh, an irregular rhythm that could have degenerated into a fatal rhythm fairly quickly. And in this small village, the doctor said, you should be flown to Vancouver where they have a cardiac care unit. You need to be monitored. And she said, no, I'm in my 80s now. I want to die here. And he said, I don't have a monitor. I can't monitor you. I can't watch you. I don't know when, I, I don't know when you might go into cardiac arrest. And I said, I can be the monitor. I will stay with her and I'll hold her hand and, and feel her pulse. And if her pulse changes, the crash cart is there. I know what to do. And I sat with her all night into the morning. And around 7 in the morning, after about 12 hours with her, her rhythm changed back to a normal rhythm. And many months later, again, a man comes up to me. He says, do you remember us? Do you remember you looked after my grandmother? You made her live for a few more months. And I said, please don't say that. Please don't aggrandize me. I actually didn't do anything at all. Her rhythm changed all by itself. So please don't say I saved her. And he said, oh, but you did save her. You did save her. When? Uh, when you were with her that night? She said, I can't possibly die on this young man's watch. <laughs> and she willed herself to live. And so when, when we, when I, get self-important, I try and remember these old values and how, um, how we can ask of ourselves to be like that grand old woman the point of the exercise is not to be powerful or to, ri to be rich or to protect our ethnic group from others. The point of our lives is actually to do good things, to do the very best for ourselves and for others. Thank you very much.